Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video we're going to cover file dialogues in Excel VBA. So the video is all about how to use the built-in file dialog boxes to allow users to pick files and folders and do something useful with them. We'll start with how to use the basic file open dialog box, how to display it on screen and execute its default action which is to open up a file. We'll then show you how you can test which button was clicked on the dialog box, so if a user clicks open or cancel you can do different things accordingly. We'll also explain how to set your own file filters so you can control what file types users are allowed to work with. We'll mention a few of the basic file dialog properties as well, such as setting the title and setting the initial folder path that the file dialog points to, before we move on and show you how to use the save as dialog and how similar that is to the file open dialog box. For the second half of the video, we'll look at how to use file and folder pickers, which don't have default actions, they just return the path of a file or a folder that you select. We'll explain how you can loop over the selected items collection in case you've selected more than one item and also for the final part of the video how you can combine file pickers with using file system objects to do much more interesting things with the files or folders that you select so rather than just opening or saving files you can do pretty much whatever you like. So there's quite a lot to explain here, let's get started. File dialogues are Excel's standard way of allowing you to select files and folders. If you've ever chosen to open or save a file before, and I'm absolutely certain that you have, then you will have used the file dialog. Here's an example, it's the file open dialog. This video is all about how you manipulate these objects in code, and how you use them to allow users to select files and folders. We'll start with a simple example, which explains how to display the file open dialog box on screen, and how you make it open a file. So let's get started by cancelling from this, and heading into the VB editor. We'll create a new subroutine to do this. I'm going to call mine open a file. And the first thing we'll do in there is declare a variable which can hold a reference to our file dialog. I'm going to call mine fd as file dialog. The next job is to choose which type of file dialog we want to use. So I'm going to set fd equal to application dot file dialog open brackets and choose from one of the four different types that Excel can use. So the top two items in this list, file picker and folder picker, these do exactly as the name suggests. They let you pick a file and pick a folder, and all they do is return a path to the file or folder selected. It's then up to you to choose what to do with that path. So we'll come back to those ones later on in the video. I'd like to focus on the other two options at the moment, open and save as. So as their name suggests, these have default actions. The open dialog box lets you choose to open a file, and save as lets you choose to save one. So these are just as though you'd chosen to perform these actions in Excel itself. I'm going to go with the open option for now, close the brackets, and then all I need to do is choose to display it on screen. So I can do that by saying fd.show, it's one of the very few methods of a file dialog, and then I can run the subroutine and see what we get. So we're back in Excel. The file dialog box is opened, just as though you clicked the open file button, and we can browse to different folders, find an Excel file to open up, I'll find one eventually, there's an interesting sounding one, donkey eating habits, then I can choose to open the file, and absolutely nothing will happen. And that's because we haven't yet told that dialog box what to do with the file that we've selected. So that's the next step. Performing the default action of an open or a save as dialog box is fairly straightforward. When we show it on screen, it waits for us to click one of the two buttons on the dialog, either the open or the cancel button on, in this case. So all we need to do is assume that for the moment we always click the open button, we can simply say fd.execute. This is one of the other very few methods of a dialog box. If we run the subroutine again now, and it takes us back to the same folder we were browsing the last time we displayed the dialog box on screen, if I select a file, let's go for Characters, click the Open button, and we can clearly see in the VB Editor that it's opened up another file, characters.xls, and if I look back in Excel, the file's open there as well. So I guess the other question then is what happens if we didn't click the Open button? What happens if we click the Cancel button instead? If I run the subroutine again, again it takes it back to the same place, if I choose Donkey Eating Habits, and this time I'm going to click Cancel, then absolutely nothing will happen, so that file is not opened up in either the VB Editor or in Excel. What if you wanted to do something different though based on whether you selected the open or the cancel button? Perhaps for instance if you've opened a file then there's a lot of extra code below this that 
explains what to do with that file. And if we click the cancel button, that file wouldn't have been opened. So we'd want to be able to make sure that we can test which of the two buttons have been clicked on our file dialog. So let's investigate how to do that. We'll use a variable to store the result of our file dialog. And we've got a couple of different choices of which data type to use. I'm going to declare mine as a Boolean. So I'm going to call a variable file was chosen as Boolean. But you could also choose to use a basic number as well. You could use integer, for instance. The result of the dialog box then will store from the fd.show line. So I'm going to say file was chosen equals fd.show. Now the result of the file dialog box, if you click the open button or the, or the action button, that returns true or the number minus one. If you click cancel, it returns false or the number zero. So what we can then do is write an if statement to check which of those two things has happened. So I'm going to say if not file was chosen, then message box, you didn't select a file, or they, or they clicked cancel, and then I'm going to make sure that I exit the subroutine. I don't want anything else to happen after that point. And if, so essentially we'll only execute the dialog box if we did not click the cancel button. So if I run the subroutine now, and I can choose a file, it doesn't actually matter if I do choose a file. In fact, if I just click the cancel button immediately, it says I didn't select a file, and then nothing else will happen. If I run it again, and let's choose another file this time, let's go for donkey eating habits and click the open button. This time it will open up that file. You can see it in the VB editor and also in Excel itself. Not very exciting, but, uh, but there it is. So that's the basic way to test if a file dialog box has its action button or the cancel button clicked. The sensible thing to do is use a Boolean variable and test if it was true or false. So it's true if the action button was clicked and false if the cancel button was clicked. Now I've closed down all of the other workbooks just to tidy up my screen a little bit. And there's one more problem with our file dialog box that I'd like to solve. At the moment, if I run the subroutine again, we'll see that when the file dialog box appears, it actually displays a list of all of the files in any folder. So that includes things like Word documents and PowerPoint presentations and access databases. The problem with that is, of course, if I try to choose to open up a PowerPoint presentation, you can probably guess what's going to happen. We're going to throw a runtime error because you can't open a PowerPoint presentation in Excel. So if I hit the end button there just to stop running the subroutine, what I'd like to do to solve this problem is to modify the filters on the dialog box. We need to do that after we've set a reference to the file dialog, but before it's displayed on screen. So let's give ourselves a couple of blank lines in there. And the first job is to clear out all of the existing filters. I can do that simply by saying fd.filters.clear and that will remove any existing filter. And now I want to add in my own specific filters. I can do that by saying fd.filters.add. When I add filters, there's two parameters that I must specify, the description and the extensions. Now the description is literally just a, a descriptive piece of text. It doesn't matter what you type in here. But the first filter I'm going to add will show only XLS files, so sort of legacy Excel files, things from Excel 2003 or earlier. So I'm going to call this one old Excel files, then a comma, and then the extensions is what's important. For the extensions, this is also another string of text. We use wildcards, like asterisks, to represent any sequence of any characters, followed by a full stop, XLS, and then close the double quotes. So essentially that filter will show me any file with any string of text, but the end of the file name will be .xls. So that's all the old Excel files. Then everything else from that point is pretty much exactly the same. Let's have one that shows us the new Excel files. So this will be new Excel files, and the file extension will be XLSX. And then let's have another one. This Let's have one for macro-enabled files. So uh, macro Excel files, let's call it. And this one will be XLSM. Finally, I'd like a slightly more generic filter, one which displays any Excel file at all. So what I'm going to do for that one is paste that line in again, and I'm going to call this one any Excel files. And for the extension, I'm going to say asterisk for the file name, .xl, and then another asterisk. 
So that will show me any Excel file that any file that begins whose extension, sorry, begins with Excel, followed by any number of any characters that includes S, SX, SM, and all of the other ones as well. What I'd finally like before I run this subroutine again is to make sure that when the dialog box first appears, that this filter is set by default. So I can do that by setting the, the filter index property of the file dialog. So if I say fd.filterindex equals, and then you simply have to specify a number. And the, the filter that I've added here, the one that I want to use, is the fourth one in my list of filters. So I'm going to make that number four. So having done all that, if I run the subroutine again, we'll see we're back in the same folder again with the standard filter, the any Excel files filter listed there. That showed me all the Excel files in that folder. But I can change that if I want to, to see only the old Excel files, XLS, the new Excel files, XLSX, there actually aren't any, macro enabled files, there they are, and again all Excel files. So whichever I select now from the list and click open, that's the file that will be opened. But it means that I can't possibly select an invalid file type because of the way the filters work. Another option that you might want to restrict on your file dialog is whether a user is allowed to select more than one file at the same time. So I've closed down the characters file that I've just opened again to go back to the original movies file. And if I run the subroutine again, by default, you'll see that the file dialog allows me to select more than one file at the same time. I can do that simply by clicking and dragging a box around a bunch of files or holding down the control key and clicking on multiple files. If I then click the open button, they'll all be opened at the same time. And there you go, you can see them all listed in the Project Explorer. But what if you wanted to restrict users from doing that? What if you want them to only be allowed to select one single file at a time? Again, there's a fairly simple property of a file dialog that you can set to do that. So just after we've modified all the filters, I'm going to say fd dot allow multi select, nice easy obvious name, equals false. So that means that the next time I run the run the subroutine, when the file dialog box appears, I can't select more than one file. I can't click and drag. If I click on a file and then hold down the control key, it doesn't select multiple files. It only allows me to select a single one. So there's another thing you might want to control for your users, choosing whether or not you allow multiple files to be selected. Another useful property to set is the default folder path that the dialog box points to. As you've seen, each time we open up this file dialog, it returns to the previous folder that we were in the last time the dialog box was open. But we can modify that, so each time we open the dialog box, we could perhaps point it to the user's desktop. So we can do that by setting the initial file path property. So if I say fd dot initial, sorry, initial file name property, not file path. So it's a bit of a misnomer actually. It's not just the file name, it's actually accepts a folder name as well. So if you say fd dot initial file name equals, then I could just type in a full explicit path. So for instance, c colon backslash, etc. Alternatively, what I could do is use some useful functions to pick up on the user's profile. So I'm going to, I'm going to use the environ function, as you've seen in many of my videos before. Um, I'm going to go for the user profile, and then I'm going to concatenate to the end of that the backslash desktop. Sorry, that's meant to be a backslash, backslash desktop. There we go. So that will make sure that we point to the desktop folder for the user running the subroutine. So if I run this subroutine again one more time, we'll see this time we're pointing to the desktop of whoever's running the subroutine. Just before we move on to a slightly different file dialog type, there are one or two slightly more trivial properties you might want to consider changing. So again, just before we display this on screen, we'll have another couple of lines, one which will set the title of the file dialog. So I'm going to say fd.title uh, equals uh, open sesame. Um, you can put in literally whatever you want here. And I'm also going to change the button name as well. fd.button name equals, I'm just going to put in go, which will change it from, from the word open. So what we can do now is if I run the subroutine one more time, we'll be pointing to the appropriate folder, the desktop. You can see the title of the box is now changed to Open Sesame, usefully. The button doesn't appear to have changed its title yet, but as soon as we actually select a file that we want to open, you'll see that the button name will change. So as soon as I select a file, the button name updates to the, the new name that you've given it. So those are all the basic properties that you can modify for a file dialog box. The Save As dialog works in a similar but not identical way to the Open dialog. So let's have another new subroutine to demonstrate this. I'm going to call mine Save a File. 
without all caps turned on, preferably, save for file, and we'll have a couple of variables in a similar way to the last routine. I'm going to call the first one FD as file dialog, and the second one will be save button clicked, and we'll use this to test which one, uh, which button was clicked on the dialog box, so again it's going to be a boolean variable. What we can then do is set FD to be equal to application dot file dialog, and this time we'll choose the save as dialog type. And again, what I'll then do is display this on screen just so we can see what it looks like, fd.show. If I run that subroutine now, this is what the save as dialog box looks like. So what it does is it uses all the settings, all the um, properties from the previous time a save, uh, any dialog box, any file dialog box was open. So you can see that it's pointing to the same folder from which we last opened a file. Um, it's also filtered based on the last file type that was opened, so I opened up a, an XLS file last time. It's also set the initial file name to the, uh, the folder name that I last pointed out as well. So there's a variety of things here that we would want to change. So let's head back to the VB editor. I'm just going to cancel this for the moment and I'm going to set all the other properties to make sure the dialog box works sensibly. The first thing I'd like to do is change what the default folder path that the dialog box points to is. So I can do that in a similar way to last time. I can set the initial file name property of the dialog box. So I'm going to say fd dot initial file name equals. And I'd like it to point to the desktop, but to have the file name set to be the name of the current file. So what I'm going to do is say environ user profile, just like last time. And then I'd like to concatenate to the end of that the desktop folder. So the name desktop with an extra backslash at the end. And finally, I'd like to concatenate to the end of that the name of the current workbook or this workbook. So I'm going to say ampersand this workbook dot name. So once I've done that, if I run the subroutine again, we'll see the dialog box is slightly different now. It's pointed to my desktop folder and it's got the name of the current workbook, Top Movies 2012, but it's still using the, um, the file type from the last version of my file dialog. So it's still using the XLS file. What I'd really like to do here is use the current file type, which is actually XLSM. So in order to do that, I've got a few restrictions on what I can do with the filters with a save as dialog. I can't actually clear all the existing filters or add in my own. What I can do though is set what the default filter is. So I'm, what I'm going to do is I have to work out which number the, uh, the filter is. So you can see from the list, they're numbered from top to bottom, one, two, three, etc. So what I'd like to do is set the initial filter to be number two. So if I cancel out of this dialog box again and head back to my, um, my subroutine, if I say index equals two and then run the subroutine again, We'll see this time it's selected the second filter in the list, so now it chooses an XLSM file, which is exactly what I want. What we can now do is check which button has been clicked on the Save As dialog, and that works in a very similar way to how it works for an open dialog. What we need to do is store the button clicked when we show the dialog box on screen. So let's say Save Button Clicked equals FD.show, and then after that we can test which one it was. So we can again say, if not, save button clicked, then we know that we haven't selected a, a file properly, or we've clicked the cancel button or closed down the dialog box without clicking the save button. So we can say message box, uh, you didn't choose to save, or something along those lines. And then exit the subroutine, because that might have affected all the lines of code below this. We'll make sure we end if. And if we successfully pass that test, we can actually execute the action for the dialog box. So again, we can just simply say fd.execute, and that will perform the save as method. So let's quickly give that one a test. If we run that subroutine, and it points us to the desktop folder, I might put it in the YSL folder just for somewhere different to put it. So I'll put it in the YSL folder, click this, the cancel button, just to make sure that it has, says I didn't choose to save a file, and that's true. And if I just quickly check in a Windows Explorer window, um, what folder, uh, so what files exist in my YSL folder. Let me just quickly check that it's not actually there. It isn't. So if I go back and run this one again, and this time I go to the YSL folder and click the Save button, the file should have been saved in there. And if I look in the YSL folder this time, then there's the file sitting there. So that's the basics of using the Save As dialog. It's just got a couple of little restrictions to do with file filters compared to the file open dialog box, otherwise it's pretty much the same. 
Now we've seen how the basic Open and Save As dialog boxes work. What if you wanted to be able to pick a file, but then do something slightly more interesting with it? So basically anything other than open it or save it. If you want to do that, you'll need to use the File Picker dialog box, because that one doesn't have a default action associated with it. All it does is returns the path of the file that you've selected. So let's see the basics of how that works with another new subroutine. I'm going to call mine Pick a File and we'll have a couple of variables dim fd as file dialog as usual and then dim action clicked as boolean so this will store the result of the dialog box whether we click ok or cancel effectively we'll set fd equal to application.file dialog and this time we'll choose the file dialog file picker what I'd then like to do is set a couple of basic properties of the dialog so I'm going to say fd.initialfilename equals and I'd like this to be set to the user's desktop folder to begin with. So I'm going to say environ, open brackets and quotes, user profile, ampersand, backslash, desktop. Then I'll also make sure that I can only select a single file to begin with. So I'm going to set the allow multi-select property to be equal to false. And then finally, I'll show the dialog box on the screen and store the result of the action clicked or the button clicked in the action clicked variable. So action clicked equals fd.show. Then I can check if action clicked, so if I did click the action button rather than the cancel button, then, and if, what I'd like to do is just print out the path of the file that I've selected. So I'm going to use the debug.print statement to do that, and I'll display the immediate window in just a moment. To retrieve the path of the file that was selected, a file dialog has a collection called selected items. And what it does, it stores a list of numbers effectively. So if you had selected more than one item, which in this case I can't, then you might have uh, stored an entire list of different numbers. If I'm only selecting a single file, and I know I can only select a single file, the index of the selected item must be the number one. That's always the first item that's been selected. So if I print out the, uh, the value of the first selected item, then, if I just display the immediate window before I run this, when I run the subroutine, if I click into the subroutine first and then run it, I can browse to a file. Let's go for files for course and donkey eating habits again. Click OK, and the immediate window will just simply print out the value of the path of the file that I've selected. So that's the basics of how a file picker works. Now that we've seen how to get the path of the selected item, we need to work out what to do with it. So for this example, what we'll do is create a backup copy of the selected file in some sort of archive folder on this machine. The best way to do that is using the Microsoft Scripting Runtime Object Library. And if you've watched the previous two videos in this series, you'll know how useful that can be. So we'll have a separate subroutine altogether into which we can pass in the path of the selected item and make that new subroutine create the backup copy. So to start with, head to the Tools menu and choose References. And then we'll need to set a reference to the Microsoft Scripting Runtime Library. I'm not going to explain in too much detail about how this works, because that's the job of the previous two videos in this tutorial. So if you haven't already watched those, now might be a good time to go and familiarize yourself with the Microsoft Scripting Runtime. Click OK. And then let's write another new subroutine. I'm going to close down the immediate window to give myself a bit more space. And I'm going to write a new subroutine called um, Create Copy of File. I need to be able to pass into this subroutine a file path. So what I'm going to do is open a set of parentheses and create a parameter for the subroutine. I'm going to call it file path as string. Close the parentheses, nearly forgot. Hit enter a couple of times, and then we can write the subroutine which will do this job. The first thing we'll need is a variable which can hold a reference to a file system object. So I'm going to say dim fso as scripting.filesystem object. Second nature by now, having followed the previous two videos, I hope. Then we'll also have a variable which stores a reference to the file that we'll copy. So we'll say dim file to copy as a scripting dot file. I'm also going to have a variable which will hold the folder path of the archive folder because I want to check if this already exists and if it doesn't I want to create it. So I'm going to say dim archive folder path and this is just going to be a string as a string. And then we'll set our file system object equal to a new instance of one of those. So set FSO equal to a new scripting.filesystem object. I'm then going to set my archive folder path. So I'm going to say archive folder path equals, and I want this to be set to be the uh, a 
a folder that sits on the user's desktop just for the sake of convenience. So I'm going to use the Environ user profile and then tag on the desktop folder with a concatenate symbol, ampersand, backslash desktop, backslash archive. Now before I attempt to copy the file, I want to check if that folder exists. And if it doesn't exist, then I want file system objects to create it for me. So I can do that by saying if not fso.folder exists, open parentheses, check for the archive folder path, then I'd like my file system object to create it, so fso.create folder, and then I simply need to pass in archive folder path again. End if, and then I know that that folder exists ready to have my file copied into. So the next job is to get a reference to the file that I want to copy. So I'm going to do that by saying set fol uh, sorry, file to copy, file to copy, there it is, equal to fso dot, and again there's a convenient method that helps me get a reference to a file, it's called get file. I've got to pass in a piece of information to get a reference to a file and it's the file path. Um, now slightly confusingly I've called my parameter for the create copy of file um, subroutine the same as the parameter name of the get file method. What I think I might do is change my parameter name to make it unique. I'm going to call it file path to copy. And then what I can say in here is get file file to copy, uh, sorry, file path to copy. Getting confused with all these similar names. So close the parentheses, and that now stores a reference to that file in that variable. Finally, what I can do is say file to copy dot copy, unsurprisingly, and I've got one single parameter that I must fill in, and that's the destination path and name. So the, the folder path will be archive folder path, but I've also got to give this file a name as well when I, when I copy it. So I need to tag on a backslash to separate the folder path from the file name. And then I'm just going to make sure the file has the same name with its copy as it does from where, from where it lives already. So I'm going to give it the same name. I'm going to say file to copy dot name. Okay. The last job, just a little bit of tidying up and good practice, I'm going to set FSO equals nothing, and that subroutine will now perform the job of copying the file that I've selected using my file picker dialog box. All I have to do now to make this system work is replace the debug.print line with a line which calls my second subroutine. So I'm going to remove debug.print, and I'm going to use the call keyword, which is optional, but I always tend to use it myself. Call create copy of file, there's the name of the subroutine. If I'm using the call keyword, then I need to wrap up the parameters in a set of brackets. So if I open a set of round brackets, you'll see it lists out my parameter names, file path to copy as a string. And the path that I want to pass into that subroutine is whatever the path of the first selected item is. So if I just close the brackets at the end of there, then this subroutine will now create a copy of the file that I select. So just before I run it, let's have a quick look at the desktop just to reassure us that the, uh, the archive folder doesn't exist yet, which it doesn't. So back to the VB editor, and I'm going to run this subroutine, and I'm going to pick a file from somewhere in the VBA files folder. So VBA files, files for course, and I'm going to go for the donkey eating habits, because that's quite a fun file to copy, so I'm going to click OK. And what should have happened is that that file has been copied. So let's have a look back at the desktop folder, and there's my archive folder, and inside there will be a copy of donkey eating habits. So there it is. That's how the basics of that system work. Now to make this system a little bit more interesting and perhaps useful, what we could do is allow the user to select more than one file. So if we change the allow multi-select property from false to true, we can actually select more than one file. And I want to create copies of every single one of the files that I've selected. In order to do that, what I'll need to do is loop over the collection of selected items. And the standard way of doing that is using a simple loop count variable. Now the selected items collection is stored as a long. So if I just open the parentheses again after selected items, you can see it has an index as long. So that allows you to select a huge number of different files. All we've got to make sure of is that the variable we, we declare can store the same data type. So I'm going to declare a new variable dim um, loop counter, slightly descriptive name, as long. What we can do in there, then, within my if statement, is rather than just calling my create copy of file subroutine once, we can begin a loop. So we can say for loop counter equals 
1 and I want this to carry on incrementing up to the limit of the selected items. So I can do that by saying fd dot selected items dot count. So that tells me the maximum number of items that have been selected in that instance of the dialog box. A couple of lines further down we'll need to say next loop counter to make sure it moves on to the next file essentially. And then when we're calling the create copy of file subroutine, rather than explicitly saying which item we want to copy, we're simply going to say loop counter. So that will increment as we work through this loop. So having done all of that, all I need to do now is start running this subroutine again. I'm going to go back to VBA files and files for course, and I'm going to select a whole bunch of different files this time. So let's go for a couple of Excel files, a text file, an access database or two, a PowerPoint presentation, a Word document. And if I click the OK button now, it's finished. If I have a look back in my archive folder, there's a copy of every single file that I've selected. Nice and simple. So that's how easy it is to combine file dialogues with file system objects. And the two work beautifully hand in hand together to do really, really useful techniques like this. The one type of file dialog that we haven't seen yet is the folder picker, which is very similar to the file picker, except that instead of picking files, you're picking folders instead, somewhat unsurprisingly. So let's see if we can extend this subroutine a little to allow the user to select what the archive folder name will be. So rather than having them hard-coded, as always copying to the archive folder on the desktop, we'll let the user pick that folder using a folder picker dialog. So we can get away with actually using the same FD variable as we used to launch the file picker dialog box. What we'll do is let the user pick a folder first and then store the selected folder path in a variable and then let the user pick the files to copy and then process that loop as normal. It's quite important that we do it that way round. We need to make sure that the user selects the folder first and then the files because in this loop here we need access to the list of selected items and it makes it much easier if we do it this way around. So we'll have another variable in the subroutine which will store the selected folder path. So I'll call that selected folder path, which sounds like a nice name, as string. And then we can simply use the same file dialog to display a folder picker instead of a file picker. Most of the things that we do are very, very similar to what we do with the file picker. So we need a variable, uh, we need to set what type of object it is, we need to set the initial file name, allow multi-select, show it on screen and then check if we've clicked the action button. So I'm just going to copy all of those lines as they are, paste them in. I'm going to change it from a file picker to a folder picker. I'm going to make sure that allow multi-select is false rather than true. I only want to select a single folder. I'm going to show the file dialog on screen and store its result in action clicked. And then an if statement to check if the action button was clicked, then I'm going to store the selected folder path in the variable that I created. Selected folder path equals fd dot selected items. And I can only select one, so it must be the first item in the collection. So fd dot selected items one. I'll have a little else clause here that says message box, you didn't pick a file or pick a folder, sorry. It's a folder picker, not a file picker. And then exit sub to make sure that I don't try to copy files if I haven't picked a folder. Make sure I've got end if. I think I'll also change the title of my dialog box as well to make it a bit more obvious what each of these dialog boxes is for. I'm going to say fd.title equals pick the folder to copy files into. I'm also going to set the title of the other dialog box as well. I'm going to say fd.title equals select files to copy. Just make it a bit more obvious what's going on. Okay, so we're nearly there. We've just got to make a couple of changes now to the way the second subroutine works. So instead of just passing in the file path that I want to copy, I've also got to pass in the folder path that I want to copy those to. So I'm going to repurpose my variable archive folder path. Rather than have that as a separate variable, I'm going to convert that into a parameter of the subroutine. So I'm going to select that and move it by clicking and dragging into the parameter list just after a comma after the first parameter and get rid of the dim statement there. I also need to make sure that the archive folder path doesn't get reset to the desktop archive folder. So let's remove that line entirely. 
Finally, we need to make sure that when we call this method now, when we call this subroutine, we pass in the selected folder path. So, after we pass in the path of the file to copy, have a comma, and then pass in the selected folder path. Let's just drag the screen across so we can see everything in a single screen width. And I think, after all that hard work, we should be ready to go. Let's give it a quick save first, and then we're ready to test it. So let's make sure we uh, click into the subroutine we want to run, and then hit the Run button. And we should get asked, first of all, to pick the folder to copy files into. And it's pointing to the desktop originally. I'm actually going to create my own new folder, which I'm going to call I don't know, My Backups or something along those lines. That'll do. And that's the folder that I want to select. It's selected there. I can click OK. Now I've got to pick the files to copy, and that's what the title of the dialog box says, select files to copy. So I'm going to go back to the VBA files folder, files for course, and just pick a selection of these files by holding down the control key and pick a variety of those files. Um, what I can then do is click the OK button, and that should create a copy of every single file that I've selected in a brand new folder. So if I head back to my Windows Explorer window, we should see I've got a new folder now, My Backups. If I give that one a quick double click, there's a list of all the files that I've selected to copy. So once again, another neat view of how you use file dialogues combined with file system objects to do really useful things with modifying the file and folder structure of your computer. I think that's probably enough for one video. Um, thanks for watching, hope you found it useful. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wisel.co.uk.